Joshua Smith here, and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. Now get shit done and smash that subscribe button now. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode Podcast interview where every single week I interview top real estate professionals, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badass though they're dominating their space. And today, you guys got another amazing rock star guest here on the podcast. Our guest today, Gus Munoz Castro, um, is a, uh, uh, when you break this down, man, this dude is a lead conversion master, right? So what I mean by that is, man, you're getting leads in, uh, our ability as real estate agents to go out there, follow up with those leads, convert those leads into appointments, set appointments, so then we can get face-to-face, um, as you know, most of, most realtors are great face-to-face. Um, uh, most realtors can be okay with lead generation or go with lead generation. Where most realtors' issue really falls is their ability to convert leads, right? In most cases, uh, our issue isn't the number of leads that we're getting or our leads in general. It's our inability to be able to convert leads at a high level. And, you know, Gus uh, uh, is, has become a master through his journey, his personal experiences. He left the corporate world uh, where he worked, uh, uh, was, a, was a senior engineer at Microsoft, um, decided to leave that, uh, uh, leave that career path jump uh, in to assist his wife uh, inside her real estate business. His wife had been a realtor for some time, started creating a, a, a lot of success in her real estate business, jumped in to be able to support her. He became a realtor. And through that journey of, of them working together and figuring out how he could support her, um, uh, he stumbled, <coughs> excuse me, stumbled across this whole um, ISA concept, this ISA role. And uh, started having tremendous success, man. Just found that that was kind of his gift, his, his you know, uh, uh, thing, his jam, um, which then led into uh, others reaching out to see if he could help them with that, which boom, fast forward now today. And uh, he owns a massive ISA company uh, that helps agents go out there and, and help convert their leads, you know, right? So, um, uh, which we'll break all that down today. But guys, just so you know, uh, Power ISA, Gus's uh, ISA company today, um, they are doing over 50,000 calls on a daily basis, 50,000 follow-up reach outs on a daily basis, and setting over 100 appointments each and every day. You know, right? So when you do that type of volume, eventually you figure this out. And um, uh, during this interview, we spent a lot of time with him and we break down Gus's journey, what led this, how he learned this, you know, and so forth. But we we break down... Uh, uh, his top tips and best practices from an agent standpoint of of okay if you're an, if you have to play the ISA in your own business which you know a lot of it, when we're starting off in individual agents that's what we have to do you know like, what are the top things to make sure that you nail that you get right um that if you focus on these you know these few things you'll have the highest level of conversion uh, 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 to going out there and creating success then you know if you expand and you get to that point where you want to hire an ISA whether it be in house inside your business or if you want to outsource uh, to a, an amazing company like Gus's company, um, uh, you know, what is needed and how do you have success that and leading that process and so forth. So Gus shared so much, uh, shared so much amazing information that we can all learn from that will have a, a massive impact on our businesses if we pay attention, if we learn, if we take note, and then uh, uh, most importantly, if we go out there and execute on what we learn. Now, real quick, before we jump in, if you haven't already, make sure to snag my new book, dominate your real estate business top tips from a top producer there's 42 chapters each chapter is a different tip from me personally uh with uh, top strategies uh, uh just top things that you know i've learned throughout my success journey uh that are important to understand the important to know and walking you through uh why they're important and then how to do those things and implement those things inside your business so you know i'm breaking down a lot of different things in inside this book from you know tracking to time management to goal setting to mindset stuff um but also as well as is is getting very tactical with very specific scripts um uh different lead generation strategies different ways to go out there and gain more clients and so forth so there's a lot covered inside here um it's 100 percent free nothing being sold you guys this isn't one of those i, I know we we jump on social media we we, we see a free book ad, we click on that, and now they want some money, and we get taken down another funnel. Next thing you know, we spend a ton of money. Um, this is 100% free. It's a digital copy uh, that will be emailed in, <coughs> to you and be in your email box 
within seconds. Um, again, nothing being sold. There's no fluff in this book. I just get right to the point and share these strategies that can help you grow and eventually lead to you dominating your real estate business. So go to joshuasmithfreebook.com. Again, joshuasmithfreebook.com. Grab your copy now and let's jump into this amazing podcast interview with Gus. All right, Gus, my man, welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast, my friend. Hey, thanks so much, man. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm stoked for this, man. I, I'm excited to have you on. I'm excited to, to be able to learn from you and pick your brain on, on, a, on a selfish front. To, <laughs> that's what's so great awesome. about, about being a podcast host is, you know, I mean, the self-development that I get out of, of you know, being able to pick amazing, you know, uh, people's brains like yours and, you know, and then our audience, man, uh, 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 you know, is able to gain so much amazing knowledge as well. So it's, a, you know, kind of a win all the way around. And, you know, look, dude, I mean, you've built now, um, you know, the, this insane ISA inside sales business, uh, 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 you know, it's offered to real realtors out there and, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of active clients at this point. I think I saw what you guys are doing, 50,000 outbound dials every day, um, setting over a hundred appointments every day with buyers and sellers. Um, uh, so, you know, I know that you're going to be, you know, uh, be able to have a lot of, uh, uh, great info for all of us to learn from because it's, you know, mo most agents don't have a lead generation problem. They have a lead conversion problem, you know, and it, it seems to be kind of that common thing that, that people struggle with. Um, and, uh, but before we get into all that, man, you know, I'm intrigued in your journey, dude, because looking at your background, man, like you didn't start off in real estate, you know, right. Uh, uh you know, you're in the tech world and, and I'm just kind of curious, like, how this whole journey started and what progressed you to where you are today. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me on the show, man. I appreciate it. I love your style. I love what you do here uh, at GSD mode. Uh, and well, it's a great question because yeah, I, you know, if you look at the first half of my resume, it's like, what happened, right? What's going on? Uh, so, you know, I, I'm born and raised in Mexico on the border with California, which is why I have this like Southern California accent. Uh, you know, and, and I, I grew up in both countries, you know, a lot of family in Southern California and all my cousins would make fun of you if you spoke, you know, English with an accent. So I got rid of that like super quick. Uh, and, and, I, and I was, I was, you know, born and raised in Mexico, but always looking in the U.S., right? I want like, this is, this is the big leagues this is where we want to be, man. This is amazing, right? Uh, it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're on the street looking at the storefront and that looks a great store inside. It's amazing. And, you know, it's a weird experience. Uh, you know, it's a very unique area that border area, right? Between Mexico and the US. That's where I'm from, that's where I grew up. And you know, and I grew up in a family that was not an entrepreneurial family. You know, I just, I just wanna say that. Um, my mom and dad were both university professors, right? Teachers in Mexico. So we were not poor, right? We, we never needed anything, to be honest with you. Great upbringing, but we weren't wealthy, right? In that sense. So they were professionals, um, you know, and, and we had, and we had a, you know, a, a pretty decent lifestyle. But, you know, living across the border from like the richest country in the world, you know, it's the world you're like, hey, wow, that's why you know, I wonder what, why, why do guys do that? Why do plumbers live so much well better than we do? Why do other professionals, you know, people that aren't professionals, don't have cultures, why, why they have, they have got amazing stuff, man. They seem like they have an easier life. That's interesting. I wonder what that's about. I had that curiosity. I had that curiosity that there might be other ways to, to, to live, right? Because my, my parents are all about, you got to get a degree. You got to get your master's. You got to get your PhD. Don't be like your folks. It took so long to get their graduate degrees. Got to hustle, bro. You got to get those graduate degrees early in life, right? So you can get that professorship. So you can be that, you know what I mean? That was the path, right? That was like mastery in that sense, like mastery, grind, hard work. I, I definitely learned that. My mom was like, you know, sitting down with you, doing that homework since I was in kindergarten, right? Like, hey, go, go, go. Let's make it happen. Um, so, so I, I, I really learned that from her, the grind, like, yeah, I know you don't like this. I don't like this either. <laughs> so <laughs> let's do it. I still got to do it. Who cares? I don't care. So, you know, uh, uh, so that I'm really grateful for that. The work ethic and the values were amazing, but they definitely pointed me in a, in a particular direction. This is what you should do, right? This is where you should go. You're going to go to this, the best school, like best grades, go to the best school in Mexico. We couldn't afford it. 90% scholarship. My, my brother, I have a twin brother, by the way, got a hundred percent scholarship full ride uh, to, to back in the nineties, the best university, in Mexico, private university in Mexico. Like, let's do, let's do this, man. Game time. Let's go. And you know, like, Hey, I was rising that career path, meeting those expectations, exceeding those expectations. Um, you know, and, and I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in college. I'm in school. What do I, what do I want to do? Right. And, and it was the late nineties. 
I, you know, and in the US, it was the full on internet boom, the first internet boom, right? The, the, it was web 1.0, it was amazing. It was like, the internet's gonna eat everything. We're all gonna be shopping on the web in a few months. That's what we thought. This is, this is a real thing back in 1999. And, you know, I said, I got, this is what I gotta get into, right? Because I'm gonna get into technology and, gonna, and that's gonna open doors for me. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Like, this is going to be great. I'm either going to be an academic in this space, like internet technology engineering, or I'm going to go work in the States, right? Uh, internet technology engineering. And that's what happened. Uh, you know, th through the top school in Mexico, which is the only school that U.S. companies would recruit at, the only one back then. Now there's more. They didn't go anywhere else. Um, I got recruited by Microsoft. And I was like, hey, you know, folks, I'm going to take a little break from the academic academia path. And, you know, but, you know, the funny thing is, Joshua, for parents – you know, being part of a huge university or being part of a huge corporation, that was an easy switch. I'm like, yeah, man, go into the mothership. Like, great, good job. Like, good job. And in the mothership, you know, become an, a lead engineer and a senior engineer and a principal engineer. It was, it, it was like, great, uh, great job. That was awesome, right? The, the parents approved. The parents approved of that. And I went in and I, and, I, and I jumped. And I had made it, Joshua, man. I was 23 years old, making 70 grand a year, you know, single, I was like, you know, my first job ever, right? My first actual job, I made it, right? They, they took me to my high school to give like a talk of how a successful professional I was. I had been at work for like a month or two, right? It was like, it was kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was a, little, a little bit of a minor celebrity, right? At the, at the time, uh, you know, it was like, oh, wow, I've made it. And, you know, I remember my boss, this is my first boss in Microsoft. I'm going to remember this forever. He said, man, Gus, I'm, I'm not sure if I should be super happy for you or feel sorry for you. This is my boss. He was an entrepreneur, by the way. He was a full-time engineer and had a gig on the side. He's like, I sh I'm not sure if I should be happy for you or be sorry for you. I'm like, but why? Like, dude, I made it. He goes, yeah, but this is the best job I've ever had. And, 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 I'm, and I'm 45, or almost 50, right? And this is your first job, right? Oh, hey, hey Josh, I got my little kid coming in. Oh, here. Yeah. No worries. Keep it, just keep it real, right? Keep it real. Is fast? Wait a minute. There he goes. Yeah, kids, kids running around today. So, uh, this is the best job I've ever had, and I'm almost fifty. And this is your first job. So, like, bro, I mean, like, where are you going to go from here? Like, this is the best company ever I've ever worked for. And that kind of stuck with me. I didn't really know what he meant by that, to be honest with you. I'm like, okay, well, cool, great comment. That's awesome. Um, you know, let, let's see what we're going to do with that. And you know, and I started working there, just killing it, killing it, killing it. I rose through the ranks. And, and, and you know, something happens in your mid twenties. This happened for me that I'm like, you, you kind of start like noticing things, right? You kind of start like questioning some things. You kind of say, Hey, what's, what, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? What is it I'm good at? Who am I? I had not asked these questions ever in my life. My path was laid out for me, right? It was like, go to this school, do this job, get that title, go to the next ladder, rise, rise the ladder, get the good grades, go meet the expectation. Cause you're going to be rewarded with that clear expectation right and I was great at it I was great at it and but I you know and, and, and it sneaks up on you Joshua it's like it gets a little harder to wake up in the morning right it gets a little harder to go to that job every morning it's like why why does why does all this stuff not make me as satisfied as it used to be I had the house I had the cars you know the 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 you know six-figure engineer job at that point right I was a manager three years in the Microsoft I became a, a, a manager there uh, which was super fast. I was like, you know, felt I was fast tracking it, doing amazing. And, you know, it's, it's you know, you start realizing that, yeah, you know, I, I, there, there's a plateau I'm going to reach, to be honest with you, right? There's a, I, I'm seeing the people around me and they enjoy this. There's people that, let, that enjoy it more than I do. They're, they, they're better at it than I do. They've got a totally different outlook on it than I do, right? And, and you start real feeling that that's you're feeling different, right? And also, this is really interesting. I had skills that not only were not valued by the organization, and again, I don't want to knock on Microsoft. It's a great company. I love it. Um, but I had skills that other engineers kind of frowned upon, right? They were sales skills. They were people skills. They were hustling skills. And among engineers, they're like, whoa. Like, you know, it, it, the engineers put their guard, the guard up, goes like, whoa, bro, are you trying to sell me on something? What's going on? And, and you know, because that's weird, right? It's a little bit, little bit different, a little bit odd in that, in that environment. Um, and it was not always, you know, uh, celebrated or, or appreciated, right? And I was good with people. My friends at Microsoft would, would always, uh, you know, make fun of me a little bit. Like, oh, there's Gus, the networking guy. He's always talking to people. He's always connecting with people. You want to talk about Gus as a networking guy. He's, he's, he's a networker. 
in the most derisive way you could think. That's not a compliment in that in that little circle, right? Coming from all these introverts, you know, right? Like it, they it, don't know how to handle you. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you know, it was like a gag, a running gag. Hey, it's that you know, anyone ever wanted to meet so well, go talk to our, our networker, his Gus. Go, he'll he'll figure something out for you, he'll connect you with somebody, right? Um, you know, a little bit of sarcasm there, you know, but but there was a lot of truth in that. I was weird in that environment, right? That was kind of what they were telling me. Um, and and so it, with everyone's life, Joshua, there comes a time where something, a, 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 a coincidence of events, an accumulation of little things start to tell you, hey, you got to make a change. You know, that there's something, uh, you're not being satisfied. You either have to kind of put your head down and keep grinding and just keep going wherever the flow goes. And you and some people do that. And I saw people do that in Microsoft. It's a, again, they're, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, becoming complacent with a six-figure paycheck, you know, and the best of everything, private schools, best homes. And it's, I mean, that's a pretty good job to be stuck in, right? And quote, unquote, stuck in. I get it. But for me, it wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for me, right? Plateauing at age, this was by, by this point when I was, it was really getting hard for me, was probably age 30 for me. I, I, almost a decade there, right? Almost a decade there. It doesn't happen overnight for me. It took a while to change the programming, to kind of realize there was something different, right? And the catalyst of this whole thing was my wife, to be really honest with you. I met her in Mexico. She joined me in 06 up in, up in Seattle. Um, and she presented this book to me, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Dude, oh. this, is back, this is back when we met in college, by the way. I was 19 when I read that book. And that book, I know it's the cheesiest thing ever, right? The Rich Dad, Poor Dad, whatever. Man, it's just true. It's 100% true. I read that book and it was the first time I was 19 that I questioned like, wow, this is really interesting. Why am I, why do my parents behave like the poor dad? They're like, literally this guy could have come into my house and written the book just by watching them interact. It was uncanny, right? The, the, you know, not just the, the focus on, you know, the, on being an employee and, and, and growing within an organization, but the, you know, like the, the, it was the disrespect towards business and business people and entrepreneurs, right? It was like, you know, a bordering on contempt, right? It was like, you know, it was like, whoa, yeah, ah, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be on the streets hawking stuff, hustling. You want to be a professional. Right? This is, we are the professional class. We're, you know, there was a little bit of that, a lot of that going on, Joshua. So it took me about a decade to change that programming, kind of get, open my mind up to other things, but I knew those things existed. And my wife was a big part of that. She came from an entrepreneurial family, right? She, so she had that influence. And, and by, you know, uh, being with her and meeting all the people around her, I was like, what do you mean you guys don't do nine to five? What do you mean you guys buy stuff cash? What, do you, what is that? What are you, what are you talking about? What, do, what does that even mean? Um, these are people that ran their own businesses, right? And they were in agriculture, uh, commerce. Um, they, they did their own thing. They did their own thing. And I thought that was really interesting. And it, was, uh, it wasn't until 2013 that I decided to leave the mothership. I was like, okay, man, I'm gonna bet on this. I'm gonna, and here's the thing I did. I said, I'm gonna help my, my wife got licensed in real estate in 2008. And for people that don't know, might not have been around that time or don't remember, the world was ending, right? It was like, you know, it was like, it was like COVID, but it took a year to happen, not a week, right? It was like a year to kind of roll around and people weren't sure what was gonna happen. It just got worse and worse, right? So she became licensed in real estate and was like the rookie of the year with I think like eight transactions or something, eight or nine transactions. It was like the be like the top performing rookie, right, for her office. And that was, you know, that that that's how I got involved in real estate. And she would hustle on the side. It wasn't a full time job for her. It was like part time, somebody's full time, and she would have a lot of fun with it. I had more fun helping. I got licensed in 2010. I had more fun helping her like nights and weekends, nights and weekends, than I did, you know, doing my thing at Microsoft. And that was like very eye-opening for me, right? Something that got you excited, something that was like mine, something. So my wife kind of gave me that taste in a really safe environment. I still had my full-time job, right? I would help her out, help her out. And then, you know, uh, one thing happened that, that, that I think really, really shook me. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2012 and at 62 or 65 years old, right? So that like shook me to the core to be honest with you, right? If people don't know, that's an awful disease. You're essentially, it's essentially, you know, you're, you're gonna end up a vegetable at some point and, you're, and your mind gets, you know, blown to pieces little by little, bit by bit, bit by bit. 
Um, and it's always the toughest for the caretakers and the family. The patient itself doesn't really suffer that much, to be honest with you. It's the people around you that kind of kind of see that happen, right? So, and, and my grandmother had gone through that. So she had seen that up close and she knew what was gonna happen. I had, I had seen that up close. I knew what was gonna happen. And, and, and but, but my, my grandma happened, she was almost 80 when that happened, by the way, right? My mom had it at 65. So I was like, bro, you know, you think you have all this time to like work the grind, meet other people's expectations. And then you're gonna go do your own thing at some point, right? So what happens if you don't have that time, right? What happens if, you know, you have way less time than you anticipate? Um, so, so that just hit me like a ton of bricks. So in 2013, I said, this is the year, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna bet on myself. I'm gonna go nuts. Um, and I'm gonna, but I did, I'm gonna take a six month hiatus. I was even, I was even like compartmentalizing it to like that, right? I said, hey, I'm the engineer, right? I'm gonna take a six month hiatus. I'm gonna help my wife build a real estate team because she was growing, you know, this, this was 2013. The wind was at our backs. The market was on the rise, right? It hadn't been that long, but it was the beginning of a seller's market that hasn't ended yet, at least in that area, the Pacific Northwest. So, hey, this is the time. This is the moment. Um, and I said, I'm going to take a six-week break from Microsoft. It was a July 2013, and I haven't looked back. I never went back, right? So I, I said goodbye to the six-figure paycheck. My friends were like, the hell are you, what are you talking? This is like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. I didn't even tell my parents, by the way, until I was like, had done it. Like, hey guys, guess what? I did this. I'm like, oh, oh okay. Well, we just want you to be happy, right? It was, it was like, I didn't get their input on it, right? Like, I, 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 again, they love me. They don't want me to suffer, right? They, they are very risk averse. And they would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, this is nuts. What about your 401k? What about my stock options? So if people don't know this, these big tech companies, they, they always put your compensation rolling for five years. So, so the longer you stay, the more you lose by leaving because your latest stock option, which might have been $50,000, $100,000, is spread out over the next five years. So you walk, if you ever leave those companies after a few years, you walk away from a lot of money, from a lot of money. And, and, and I, for me, I just realized that, I, I, man, if I never bet on myself now, when I have no kids, I've got very little responsibilities, you know, it's like if my wife is supporting me. I'm like, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to do it, right? Like, you, and, and once you realize how little you have to lose, how little you have to lose, um, you know, you know, we're in the, a, a first world country, man. It's not like, you know, it's not like back home in Mexico. I'm not in a small town in Mexico where if I don't make it, my survival is at stake. This is not the case, man. This is not the case. Um, so I said, you know what? Let's make it happen. Let's see what happens. And I bet on myself for the first time ever. I went on my path for the first time ever. And I, and I went all in. I went all in. And, and that was the beginning of my career in real estate. I built up my wife's team. We were like a three, four person team doing 10 million a year. And then I discovered this inside sales role, inside sales agent. And I was like, the light went off for me. It's like, oh, whoa, this is interesting, right? It was a very efficient lead generation role, right? Instead, because I was, I would be door knocking, I would be doing open houses, I did everything for lead generation, everything. Networking events was my number one thing because I'm the networker. I would go to all these events, drive around, meet people, and I'm like, you can sit down in, in your office all day, make phone calls, and connect with a hundred people a day. I'm like that again. The engineering mindset that's really efficient. That's really efficient, and it can be salaried. Holy cow! Whoa. That's really interesting as well, right? So I, I built my first ISA team uh, in Seattle. Uh, and then I said, you know what? I can probably build this in Mexico too. I, I had that experience, right? It's hard to connect the dots looking forwards. It's a lot easier to connect the dots looking backwards. I'm like, I'm from an area where people speak really good English, right? And, and they want to hustle. There's a lot of hustlers there. Um, you know, I can build an ISA team outside the US and have them work for me, right? Work for my team. So as soon as people found out about this, Joshua, I had four other real estate teams saying, Gus, if you're going to build that little call center in Mexico, hey, man, give me a seat in that call center. Can I, can I hire one of your guys? I'm like, yeah, you can, man. How much is that? Well, I don't know. It's, it's pricey. I don't know. It's pretty expensive. I'm like, well, yeah, no, it's worth it, man. Yeah, you know, uh, $2,500, you know, a month. I, I, think we can make, I think we can make it happen with that. Sign me up. Here's three months in advance. And I was like, you know, whoa. So another thing happened, right? In real estate, residential real estate, you're always hunting for clients. 
you've got to go out and you've got to hustle, got to find them, got to close them, convince them. I had never had a business, Joshua, where people were calling me like, Gus, hook me up with this. Gus, I hear you're making this happen. Sign me up. So I had my first four clients from my brokerage, my same brokerage in Seattle, sign up with me the first month. And now we have over 600 clients that we service all over North America. I have 85 uh, full-time employees and we're finishing up, you know, 2020 as we're recording this, finishing up 2020, our best year ever, right? We broke seven figures in, in, in top line revenue. Um, so, you know, uh, we're on our way, man. We're, we're, I, and I, I honestly feel we're just getting started with that project, Power ISA. We're just scratching the surface of what we can do, um, you know, and, but it's been a trip <laughs> from, from those, from that beginning uh, to kind of where, where I am right now. Yeah, dude, I love it, man. So Such powerful stuff, dude. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so cool that, like you talked about your story, growing up in Mexico, you know, kind of having that curiosity and that dream to make it, you know, come to the States, make it in the States, do it big, which you've been able to do. But then now you also, of, while accomplishing and continuing to grow that dream, are able to give back and create opportunities and successes, you know, for those in, in you know, your the country where you're from. And I'm sure that that's just so amazing seeing you know, the impact it makes on your life and your family, the impact it makes on all your guys' clients, as well as the impacts on all the, the, the lives that you're changing in Mexico with all of your, your staff. And it's, I'm sure it's, it's uh, 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 you know, just such a, a fulfilling and, and, you know, powerful, amazing thing, you know, as you reflect on it. And it, it, it is, man. And let me, let me touch on that a little bit, because, you know, I, I realized, you know, I, I, through introspection, that was a huge part of my why impacting that group of folks in, in Mexico. Again, my family too, my clients as well. I mean, no, no doubt that's important, but, but, but you got to kind of figure out what your why is, right? So in Mexico, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a developing country, right? It's a different place. Um, people that speak really good English are not necessarily appreciated, right? And it's it kind of a hard thing to describe, but, you know, people think you've been deported. People think you might be a gangbanger, drug dealer, uh, you know, this is not necessarily a good thing. And I think people kind of, you know, again, people in the U.S. wouldn't know that, but it's, it's, it's a weird thing to be. You're always that weird kid that speaks really good English. I wonder what's up, what's wrong with him. Right? That's kinda, you're, you're, why does you're he speak the, so the funny? The extroverted networker in, in Microsoft with the engineers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, exactly. You're like that guy. You're like that. No, but this is, but like, yeah, but worse, right? So you're always, always like, well, that, 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 you know, that get, plus he must be a gangbanger from LA. Who knows, right? So, so, so the, 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 I don't want to say ostracized, but there's definitely, you know, people in Mexico make it very apparent that you're weird, right? In that, in that, in that environment. In my company, I've created an environment where those, people like me are welcome, right? They are appreciated. They are compensated way above anything they could get uh, in other kinds of jobs, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and it's a safe environment for them to be who they are, right? Because, yeah, we speak funny. And yeah, we talk English like, a, like, a, like an American. And yeah, we mix both languages a lot, right? And yeah, and no one makes fun of us for that. And no one, you know, thinks we're less of, less of, a, of, a, of a valuable person because of that. And yeah, you might, some people, some of my employees have tattoos. Some of them have got, you know, nose rings. Who cares, right? right. You know, and that's something I learned by Microsoft, by the way. The weirdest looking people on the planet Earth work at Microsoft, you would not imagine. And I'm like, and, but they were great uh, engineers, great uh, coworkers, great teammates, great leaders. I was like, oh, that, oh, I get it now, right? That, so they don't care what you look like, right? And, and that's very unique in a lot of companies still. That, 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 that doesn't happen a lot, right? Um, so, so, so I've also made that like a core value of the company where we are skill, value, and ethics based, right? If you've got the skills, you've got the values, and you've got the work ethic, you have a place in the company, right? Everything else, uh, it matters way less, way, way, way less in other places. Love it, man. So, so... Uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to take this in, in um, you know, uh, uh, two directions here. Um, you know, the first I want to talk about <coughs> of, you know, what you learned through your ISA experience from, you know, you kind of having that aha and then obviously having a lot of success with it internally with your, your wife's team and so forth. And then, of course, now you've had massive success on creating a, a system to go out there and hire and train all these other ISAs and so forth. Um, you know, the first point that I want to hit on is, you know, from the ISA role itself, you know, meaning, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of real estate agents listening to this podcast that maybe aren't yet in a position to hire an ISA. 
whether it's outsourced or in-house or whatever, um, you know, at, at some point, especially in the beginning stages of a career, we're kind of having to wear all hats, you know, right? Um, um, so when an agent is in that role themselves, you know, I just kind of want to uh, 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 pick your brain a little bit and get kind of your top tips of that you've learned of, okay, hey guys, like here, here are the key things that you really need to be able to have success with your lead follow-up and convert at a high level and so forth. Um, and then, so that way it can help our listener that, you know, again, is wearing all those hats and going to be in that role themselves, plus all the other roles we got to wear as a, as a realtor. Um, but then, um, you know, kind of pivot into, uh, um, um, you know, what, what makes a successful ISA and, and for those, you know, hiring them and, and so forth. So, you know, on the first point, um, um, you know, what, what have, through this journey, man, like what have you realized, you know, what are kind of the, the top, and then there's probably a lot that goes into it, you know, but what are some of the top piece of advice that you would give, you know, any realtor out there um, uh, that are just key things that you've learned to, to have the most uh, uh, effective, you know, successful follow-up game inside their business. Yeah. And I a hundred percent agree with what you just said, Joshua, you, you, we wear many hats in real estate, hundred um, percent. I always tell folks the way I describe it is, if you, if, you don't, if you don't have an ISA on your team, you are the ISA on your team. The same way if you don't have a transaction coordinator, you are the transaction coordinator, right? All, all of these roles that we have to play uh, in real estate, 100%, I, I agree with that. And, and the way I tell uh, folks uh, you know, to, to really do their best when converting leads, right? And that, that conversion game, which you said you know, earlier, uh, most agents have a conversion problem. You know, they don't really have a lead problem. I, I, I agree with that. I think the number one problem usually is conversion. The number two problem might be the amount of leads they have, but number one is typically the, even if they had more, even if they had more leads, they might not be more successful, right? So, 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 and, and the way I usually see objections around conversion and lead generation are, Gus, these leads suck. That's usually the objection I hear. Man, you know, face, you name it, Craigslist doesn't work. Uh, Google pay per click, that never works. Facebook is, no one wants to buy. It's, they never pick up the phone. It's garbage leads, it don't work. So, you know, you know, and, and I've spoken to a lot of, you know, team owners and team leaders, you know, like myself and other folks, and it's a very common objection, man. It's a very common objection. But we all, you know, and I coincide with a lot of people about this. I go, I always hear that objection and I go, okay, there is a possibility that the leads suck. No doubt, no doubt. That is usually 1% of the case of the problem, usually of the cases, 1% is that. 99% of the time, uh, it's you suck. <laughs> you know, your process sucks. Your, your system suck, your mindset sucks, your skills at converting suck, usually. And I always focus it on three things, Joshua. I keep it really simple for folks. Number one, when you're talking about online lead generation, if we're focusing it on that, it's about speed to lead. You have to have some way to achieve speed to lead. And I totally understand, not every realtor can answer the phone on a new lead within five minutes. I totally get it, I have empathy. But there's no reason why you can't text someone instantly. There's no reason you can't do that because every CRM has something like that. And if not, you can hook, Google it. You can find a way to send an instant text message as soon as the lead comes in. And it might say, hey, you know, I'm, on, I'm in a meeting with another client right now, but hey, when's a good time to connect today, right? Or hey, I got your message through Facebook. How can I help you out, right? When's a good, when can you, you want to do a phone call or you want to do a, a one a quick text conversation, you know? So there's, there's, there, speed to lead is important because the consumer expects it the consumer expects some kind of acknowledgement that they've reached out to you. They expect uh, instant gratification. It just, it just, it is, it is what it is, right? That's what a, a typical consumer experience. And a lot of these consumers are on their cell phone when they're reaching out to you, the majority of them nowadays, right? And the younger they go, the more they're going to be on their phone, right? So they, if you, if they message you and you don't, and that phone doesn't do something in acknowledgement pretty quickly, you, you, you have less of a chance to convert that lead. Okay. That's number one, number one. Okay, but what about, let's, so let's say 10% of those leads are going to respond, they're going to be responsive right away, 10%. 90% aren't. That's just the way it is. I don't complain about that. I don't judge that. 90% of those leads are not going to talk to you right away. I get it. I understand it. We got a lot of things going on. There's a pandemic going on. There's, you know, a lot of people are hurting. Right. There's a lot of things going on, Joshua. There are great reasons why they're not going to reach out to you. The number two thing is that I tell people is you have to have some kind of follow-up plan because 90% of people are not going to be responsive in that initial you know, ping, in that initial text message, in that initial phone call, right? Or they're going to respond to their text message saying, I'm busy right now, can't talk. 
yeah, yeah, you know, try me later, right? It's a follow-up game at that point. It is a follow-up game at that point. So, you know, when ISAs on my team, uh, they got to be calling them multiple times after a stay. And they, again, for an ISA, this is easy because this is their job. Realtors struggle with this because they ha sometimes have the misconception the lead generation, lead follow-up isn't their job, right? That's something they do when they have time. That's something they do when they have time. You, you've got to change, you got to flip that script. You are a professional salesperson. Professional salespeople generate leads, follow up with leads. Set appointments, take appointments. Set appointments, take appointments. That's what you do. In any sales profession in the world, that's what you do. Lead generation, lead conversion, set appointments, take appointments. That's what you do. So if you approach it from that point of view, Joshua, you always have time for lead follow-up, right? Every day, because that's what you do. This is your job, right? G generation, lead follow-up. So if, if, even if it's an hour a day, right? Let's say, okay, you're going to keep the, the minimum viable you know, process. Okay, you're going to do lead follow-up and lead generation. I mean, the first thing is distinguishing the two because they're different, right? You've got some kind of lead generation activity. Many people go into your list, your funnel, and then lead follow-up is working the people that are already in your funnel. Yeah, those are two separate things. Generating new leads, following up with existing leads. The follow-up game is important because we have measured this. If your follow-up game does not include 16 contact attempts in 60 days, that's one six, 16 contact attempts in 60 days, there is no chance you're going to talk to 50% of those internet leads. There's no chance. You're, not, you're never going to get close to that. If your follow-up game doesn't look something like that. 16 attempts in 60 days. And, and I'm talking about a mix of phone calls and text messages. It doesn't, all, it doesn't all have to be phone calls. It doesn't all have to be phone calls. But you can at least have to mix it up, right, between the two. Um, yes, email can work too. Email, we found, is, is less effective, you know, for, for lead conversion. It's more of a nurture, you know, uh, of, a, of a brand building, top of mind uh, uh, tool at this point. Um, but, but we're focusing, might be focused on lead conversion, right? So text messaging uh, and calling is what we focus on. So you have to have some plan to implement that follow-up. And, and the number one thing I see that is an issue there, Joshua, is the mindset. People don't think that's their job. It is your job. That's exactly what you're supposed to do, right? This is the number one thing you focus on, the number one income generating activity, lead generation, lead follow-up, okay? So, and then number three, which is, okay, I always tell people, let's look at number one and two. Are you doing those? You have some kind of process around that? And, and, and most people trip up in the first or second one. But some people have the first or second one down, right? They're having conversations with leads. And usually the, the objection becomes, yeah, they don't want to work with, they don't want to meet. They're not motivated. They're not ready to go, right? So I go, okay, great. That's great. You have a couple, you have those first steps handled to some extent. That's great. Now we've got to work on scripting. What are you going to say to these people once you actually talk to them, right? Because this matters. This matters a lot, actually, right? And, and, I, and, you know, and there's, I always see a lot of objections about, hey, I don't want to sound scripted. I don't want to sound... You know, I don't want to sound like a robot. I'm like, if you sound scripted and you're not sound like a robot, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> that's, the, that's not how you're supposed to sound. You're supposed to sound like a professional, right? That's what you're supposed to sound like. If you don't sound like that, you're doing it wrong, right? If you sound, you know, uh, uh, square and with no creativity, like, yeah, that's not what I mean, right? I'm, I'm, I'm saying, if someone asks you, is this a good time to buy a home? You have to have a professional answer to that question. If someone asks you, Man, there's a bit, man, I, I don't want to sell my home. You know, I, I want to move, but man, I, I can sell my home in five minutes, but I can't buy a home in this market. What am I going to do? I'd rather just stay put and wait a few more months. If you don't have an answer to that question, a rehearsed professional answer to that question, I don't know what you're doing, right? This is the hottest seller's market we've seen in most of the country, right? So you got to be able to handle those objections effectively, right? So that's what I mean by scripts. And you got to be able to handle those. It's most scripting, Joshua, in my opinion, is mostly objection handling, right? People say something, they're prompting you and you respond. They're prompting you and you respond. Yes, there's an introduction for sure, right? Um, that's usually not the game-changing part of the script. It's what do you do when the, when the lead says the typical five to six things that every lead says to object to your, to your script. You got to know the answer to those five or six top objections. You got, how's the market doing? I can't move right now. You know, I'm busy right now. I can't, I can't talk. You know, uh, I'm just getting started. You've got to have great answers to those objections. And you always have to show curiosity. Curiosity is king in this situation, right? The, the number one thing we teach our ISAs, apart from like the general scripting and objections, is 
curiosity and building rapport. Curiosity and building rapport. It's, it's, it sounds easy, but it's actually a pretty difficult thing to teach, um, you know, and, and your natural ability helps, but everyone needs to work on that. Everyone always needs to practice on that. It's not, I mean, yeah, there's some amazing people that just do it naturally, it's great, um, but not everyone is able to do it uh, off the bat. So you build rapport by asking questions actually, right? By showing genuine interest in people, by kind of figuring out what their situation is. You know, oh, Joshua, you know, I'm not ready to go right away. I need to wait six months. Oh, that's really interesting. Why? And shut up and see what they say, right? Oh, that's wild. Oh, because I got to save up for my down payment. Oh, did you know that we have some, you know, down payment assistance or, or you can actually, someone can gift you a down payment or you can have a conversation then, right? You got to show curiosity first. So you've got to show that curiosity. You've got to build that rapport. And then you've got to know how to close them. Because the next step is that appointment, right? And here's another thing. This, this drives me nuts. I, I, and I, I see a lot of agents. Oh, yeah, they don't want to meet with me, right? Did you give them a reason to meet with you? Yeah. Is there, did you give them a compelling reason, right? Because you know, if, if someone calls me up randomly, well, not randomly, but if I signed up on a random internet uh, page, and someone calls me up and wants to talk to me, I'm going, no, I, I, I don't want, my goal wasn't to talk to you. My goal was to get more information on the house. My goal was to get my question answered. My goal was this, that. Meeting you was never part of the equation. I could have walked into a real estate office. I wanted to meet with someone. I don't want to meet with you. So the typical answer to do, do you want to meet with me is no. That is the normal answer. If you're not trying to close to the appointment by trying to solve a problem or add massive value to this lead, there is no chance you're gonna close for the appointment. There's no chance. And by the way, uh, the top people in the industry can close for the appointment 20% of the time, 30% of the time, the top people, right? So sometimes people get frustrated that they talk to three, four leads and they didn't get a conversion. Like the top people do it at 30%. Keep, you haven't talked to enough people, keep calling, right? Talk to enough people, get that percentage, make that percentage work. Um, for you. And if you're not saying the right thing, it's not going to be 30%. It's going to be 1% of your, of your leads are going to be appointments, right? So that all of these things come together. So that, that value proposition, that massive value, we call it the hook. Your script has to have an amazing hook, an amazing hook. That is going to give you a chance to get in that 20 to 30% conversion to appointment on those contacted leads, right? So it's important. And, and let's say they don't want to meet with you, but you at least qualify them, Joshua. You know what they're going to look for. You know what they want. You know what their time frame is. You should be able to qualify 50% of the people you talk to. 50% you should qualify. If you're not doing 50%, I know a kid in Mexico that could do it better than you. <laughs> that isn't a realtor. That isn't a trade. They, they, can, they can do it better than you for sure. They can do that every day of the week, 50%. Professional real estate people can do 50%, if not more. So that is, those are the numbers you have to shoot for, right? And be realistic about that. Numbers are realistic and the tools, the value proposition and the hook are important. Just really quickly, examples of hooks, VIP buyer program, you know, your 10 step program to win a bidding war, right? How do you win a bidding war? You're, you're, you've got, you know, uh, let me, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring in my lender to our conversation because they're going to talk to you about these three amazing low programs that almost nobody knows about. When can you come in and talk to us? Or maybe a Zoom, right? Remember you're locked down. When can you do a Zoom with my lender on, on the line so we can see what you, how much home you can afford? So it's always about solving their problem, adding massive value, and then they might allow you to get to the next step with them, to get to the next step. Yeah, yeah I love it, man. And I, I couldn't agree more, you know, with, with everything that you've said, dude. I mean, all this stuff is, is, is so crucial. And, you know, in my 16 years of, of you know, real estate experience now and, and, you know, as a realtor and a team leader and so forth, I mean, all of these are, are just, you know, so spot on. And, you know, one thing that I, and, and I'd like to get your take on this and your feedback on this when it comes to knowing what to say you know, right. It's okay. Hey, we can understand and speed the lead. We can also um, um, get great, I mean, CRMs, tools that have autoresponder emails, autoresponder texts that can be customized per lead sources. You know, like the one that we use um, that uh, uh, I'll give a shameless plug because I'm also the owner of uh, co-owner of the company, but perfect storm now.com. But we also have it set up where, you know, they can have autoresponder SMS video text messages specific to that lead source. And so if you can't be okay. right there, you know, right. Um, but you know, that speed, you know, that, that becomes critical ongoing follow-up. I mean, the fortunes in the follow-up, you know, like I know we both generate an insane amount of Facebook leads, 
you know, right, but autoresponder email, autoresponder text instantaneously. We try to call them uh, immediately. Um, they go on then automatically put on our thousand day long email and text strip campaign. You know, right. We're wow. calling every other day for the first 14 days, every 21 days for the first year until that communication happens. And we identify their goals, their timeframes, their expectations. And then we adjust, you know, the, the cadence from there and the timeframes from there. Um, um, but the cool thing about systems, you guys, is, you know, you can set like we have our setup where we don't even have to think about it. All this stuff gets added automatically. So all I have to do every day is clear out my task queue. You know, right. And I even have it set up when those tasks come up and even reminds me of, okay, what's the goal of this call? What's the framework? You know, where are we at? Can reference the note. It just eliminates that guesswork. So these things don't get missed. And then, but when it comes to, you know, knowing what to say, and again, th this is just something that um, uh, is a core belief of mine and has worked, served me very well um, um, uh, when it comes to selling specifically to real estate, you know, right. Um, um, you know, but you're somebody that works with agents all over, you know, right. And ISAs all over, but you know, I, I, so many people talk about sales, you know, right. Well, sales, and, and of course sales is important, but in real estate, it's not like we're selling cars or selling watches where we're trying to convince somebody that this Rolex is better than this tag or, or, or whatever people already sold on buying and selling real estate. They're already sold on the dream. They're already sold on why they want that, why they need it. You know, right. They already have that emotional attachment and so forth, you know, right. So the only thing that we are really selling is, is, you know, really our, our ability to articulate that we are the best guide to help them accomplish those real estate goals. And I've found for myself, of, uh, you know, again, I'm not saying to not study sales, but what served me at such a higher level is really studying human behavior and human connection, you know, right? Um, and, and, and being able then to give people what they want in the way that they want it, you know, right? And really just, it comes down to that deep education, as you said, and, you know, asking deep questions, coming from a place of curiosity, being truly interested, you know, right? And as you gain that more data and find out, and I call it a, 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 a bolt holes, not band-aids. Like what are those core true reasons, you know, the, the pains that, because all sales is pain and pleasure, you know, right? So what are those 100%. true pains, you know, right? Well then, you know, the more knowledge that I have, the more that I can sell the value of the appointment, you know, right? Because we're not, the mistake that I see, at least internally that I used to make and a lot of my agents make is they're trying to sell themselves over the phone instead of sell the value of the appointment, what they're going to gain from the appointment, the knowledge that they're going to gain, you know, right. Um, 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 and then at the appointment, that's where you're selling yourself, you know, right. Um, you know, but I love your take on that. It, it, you know, when it comes to kind of that knowledge base of, of knowing how to be curious and knowing to ask, answer those questions and so forth. I mean, you know, do you agree with that statement of, you know, uh, uh, understanding human connection and human behavior and, in you know, so forth with that, or what would be some of your recommendations as far as, you know, I don't know, top books or, or things for people to go out there and, so they can start mastering that path? Yeah, so I, mean, I, I agree with absolutely everything you said, Joshua. You know, and I can tell, you know, you're a practitioner of this at a high level because we can talk about, you know, the best objection handlers and the best intro scripts and the, the cold calling script versus the expired script. We can talk about that all day. Every script, every script is going to be useless unless you're listening to the other person, right? And you're looking, and I love the way you described it, bullet holes <laughs> versus band-aids, right? You know, you want to find those bullet holes. What is, you know, what, what is it that they need? What is it that they're concerned about? What is it that, 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 that they want, right? And, 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 here's, and here's a kicker. Um, people are typically guarded about those things. Not everyone is going to share those with you right away. You haven't earned the right to get that information yet, right? So that, and that's where, you know, and you, you call about understanding the human behavior, you know, and, and for me, that's about genuine curiosity, right? You, you, you want to learn kind of what they want, what it's about. You want to be, you know, kind, courteous, professional about it. Um, and you want to always find out, right? It, it just, just showing genuine interest. And I can always tell when someone's a newer, uh, you know, salesperson in your ISA and you're, when they kind of want to rush through it, right? They kind of want to, you know, get to the next question, finish up their questionnaire, right? Their script. You know, and, and, and that's not what it's about, right? It's it, it's not about checking off every box, right? Y yes, there's some questions you have to ask, but how you ask them, you know, the interest you want to show, uh, you can tell when someone's interested in you or they're, or, they're, or they're checking off a box. The consumer is not dumb, right? They 100% are able to see through that, 100%. They can tell whether you're paying attention. They can tell whether you're smiling on the phone. They can tell whether, they can almost tell whether you're standing or not, right? You've got that energy. Not, not whether you're standing or not, whether you're low energy or whether you're high energy. They can 
interpret all of those things, right? So, so all of those things matter. All of those things matter. And, but it's about finding those bullet holes and position. This is, this is the art of it, positioning yourself, your offering, right? Your team, your, your, yourself, your services as the solution, right? Uh, to whatever that, that bullet hole happens to be. And in real estate, right? Luckily, there's only a certain amount of things they want, right? It's not going to be, it's not an infinite list, right? It's not an infinite list of things. It's going to be, they, they've got, they're, they're, they're scared of the process. They have fear. They're scared of the process. They're unsure. They don't know what they don't know, right? Um, they've got some distrust, you know, oh, I'm not sure I should share some information with you. I'm not, you know, they, they're not really sure what they're going to do. Um, they, they're just, they have ignorance, right? They, you know, I just don't know what's going on. I, I know what the next step is. Um, they, and, they, and they're misinformed. They're misinformed. They might have the wrong information. Yeah, you know, I'm interested, but you know, I haven't, I haven't, you know, gotten my 20% down payment yet. So, you know, I still have to wait, but I'm just, I'm just looking, I'm just browsing. Whoa, whoa, hold the phone, right? You have an opportunity to educate the consumer and bring them the good news, um, you know, when, when, when we educate them. So removing fear, educating people, uh, uh, removing that, you know, misinformation. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be a hundred different things you have to know how to handle. It's not. I always tell my ISAs, if you can learn to handle five common objections, you're going to be above the full, above the majority of folks. If you can handle eight, you're going to be an elite <laughs> ISA, an elite realtor, eight different objections, the most common ones, right? And yes, they're different in each scenario for sure, but there's like five of them that are common to any scenario, right? So, so, so I think learning those is important, but it comes down to building that rapport, showing that genuine curiosity. Luckily though, luckily you, those, those are coachable. We found that those are teachable. Yes, there's some people that come with natural ability, for sure. I'm not going to be an NBA player, probably, because there's people that have, you know, genetic predisposition to probably be a better NBA player than me. But among NBA players, uh, you know, yeah, the training and the discipline makes a huge difference. It's not just the genetics, right? Among tall, strong people, the training and, 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 the, and the coaching makes a big difference as well. Yep, love it, man. So then on the flip side of that, you know, um, um, you know, with, and I'll make this about you and your ISA company, because that will be, I think that this can serve and help, um, you know, realtor that's listening to this, that, that wants to hire your ISA company, or maybe even if they decide to, to hire in house or whatever route that they go. But, you know, as you're delegating this extremely, extremely, extremely crucial activity, you know, to another human being, um, um, you know, and, and we talked about, okay, you know, those three things are still going to 100% apply to your ISA, you know, like I, I'll get asked, you know, like sometimes of like, um, um, oh, do you have, you know, specific, uh, uh, uh transaction coordination training, you know, the for, for, you know, like where I'm going with this is people might have the assumption that my transaction coordinators do something outside of my contract to close process. And it's like, no, look. I spent the first year, my first 48 transactions, doing my own transactions to the point where I knew exactly how one of my files done. I knew exactly what that process was. Um, um, what happens when, I mean, A to Z, every part of it. When I hire that transaction coordinator, they're not doing something different. They're, fall, they're hired <coughs> to do the exact same process that I created and replace me from doing that and to be able to you know, execute on it. So you know, a lot of times people think that like when they hire somebody it's else is going to be different than the process maybe they followed and you know so forth so you know those three things that you just talked about are going to be you know paramount and crucial I'm, I'm guessing for the isa um but as you're delegating this stuff out you know um um you know from a leader of real estate team and you, you and we'll come at this from you know you as leading this this huge massive team of isas you know um um you know what are important things to look for you know right of of okay does this you know how, how do you know if you know, people have the right skills, the right personalities. How do you inspect what you expect to make sure, you know, because a lot of this stuff too, um, you know, there's certain lead sources, you know, uh, 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 like our, our Facebook leads, for example, and I have about 180,000, you know, Facebook leads in our, our system now for the last, you know, five years that we've been generating this. And I'm sure that's peanuts compared to what you have, um, you know, but we're just <laughs> not a huge, you know, we're not servicing 600 clients out there. It's just us. Um, uh, uh, but, Overall, when we track this data, our average Facebook lead is 6.7 months out before working with an agent. You know, right now we get some that are instant, you know, right? We have some that are also two or three years, but the average is 6.7 months. So, you know, I mean, it's that nurture time. And, and 
but if if so you got to give enough time for these isas and, or or yourself to be consistent with the process and give it enough time so you can start seeing that roi and start seeing those results you know i think a, a big mistake i see a lot of realtors make is they get impatient oh i did this for 30 days it didn't work you know right you got to give things enough time but if you don't know the things to inspect when you are managing a team of 85 um, um, you know, right. You can be six, seven, eight months, nine months into this, and then, then realize that this person was a dud and it can be detrimental to us. Right. So, you know, from a, a leader standpoint, like what are those critical things from, you know, I being able to identify that, Hey, you know, I think that this person's going to be right for this role as well as, you know, inspecting what you expecting and, and ensuring that, you know, they're set up for success. Yeah. I mean, great, great, great question, Joshua. Yeah. So, Man, I could, this is, you know, we could go another hour about this, but I'm going to try, you know, do my best to kind of summarize the process, um, you know, and, and I'm going to take it from the perspective of, hey, I'm, I'm a team leader and I want to, you know, add that ISA role into my team. So there's a couple different, you know, possible scenarios, right? I'm going to take the hardest one. You've never had an ISA, right? That's typically the most difficult one, right? Because when we work with teams that have in-house ISAs or they've had, so usually we just plug in, they have a process, they know what they want. That's great. It's, it's the easiest case. When, you, when you've never had an ISA, that's probably the most challenging case, right? How, where do you even start? So number one, uh, it, it is a talent game, right? You've got to find someone that's going to be good in that role. And but what, what I mean good in that role is someone that's going to be good at sales, going to have the gift of gab, going to be able to talk to people. Um, and, and and but I'm going to say something controversial here, right? This is this is you know a lot of people don't agree with this in the industry. Um, personality matters. Personality is important. Like and I talk about disc profile. You know, all those different personality assessments, they, they work and they're, they're part of the process, but they're a, they're a much smaller part of the process than people realize. Yeah. They are a much smaller part of the process than people realize, right? And, 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 and talking the language of DISC, where high D is the red, kind of the, the you know, the entre typical entrepreneur profile, you know, assertive and go-getter and, you know, dominant, and the S and the C are more methodical, cautious, you know, that you would be surprised how many successful ISAs are SC. Successful, they're not high I, they're not high D. Successful ISAs are SC because a, 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 a lot more than we want to admit, this job is a grind, right? It is, it is do, it's being able to come in every day and do that job and make it happen and, and follow the scripts and follow the process and, and do the 10th call, do the 12th call, do because because you, at the end of the day, you trust the process, right? So I always tell folks, you know, personality assessments, we do not use them, to be very honest with you, right? I do not use them. I prefer to talk to the person. Are they good on the phone? Do they have the right language skills? Do they, do, do they meet that assessment? Do they meet the technical skills as well? Do they have the tech? Because, you know, ISA is more and more a technical role as well. It's not just on the phone. They're working in these CRMs, right? And not everyone, you know this, not everyone's, you know, comfortable kicking it in the CRM, like right? making it, using it to the most of the largest amount of their abilities, not everyone. So it's uh, the, the technical know-how, do they sound good? Do they sound personable? And as soon as we can, Joshua, get a butt in the seat and get them on the phone. That is the only way we have found on who's going to have not just the skills, but the values and the work ethic to, to, do, the, to do the role. It is much more controlling for skills, the skills being, they, you know, they, they sound good on the phone. You, you've talked to them on, on the phone. They're able to have a conversation with you. They're able to talk, you know, that, that part, I mean, that's a must. But once you've kind of controlled for that, this is a work ethic job. This is a values job. That, that's, and, and that we found is impo next to impossible to interview, interview for, right? I see too many teams make that mistake. They believe that if they it, have 18 rounds of interviews, that they're gonna have a perfect hire. I'm like, no, bro. I mean, what? I mean, this, no, you're, you're overthinking this at that point, right? Instead of ha taking two months to hire one ISA, you could have had three ISAs in the, in, in the seat, right? Well, actually, it's usually worse than that. They take two months to hire, then they're, they're so confident they made a good hire, they've, and they got the wrong person in there, they, they, they're reluctant to fire them because they just put two months of their life into hiring this person now. Now they're invested. This is the worst thing I see. They're invested in their, their, their credibilities on the line. It's my hiring process, Joshua. I can't fire this guy. I know he's going to be good. My disc profile says he's the perfect disc profile for this job. It doesn't matter, right? Instead of having that person three months and you fired him in the fourth month, you could have had three ISAs in the role. And then you got a good one the third time around. And the same, it costs you the same. 
it costs you the same. Having the wrong person three months while you kind of try to figure it out, having three people that, those same three months and you have a great hire at the end of the day. So our, my company takes about five days to let someone go when we realize they don't have the work ethic, they're not a good values fit, and they're not going to be successful at the job. We're really good at it at this point, right? It might, that's what I'm saying. It might take a typical, it might take you a month to figure this out. Maybe I'm being generous, maybe, maybe 30 days, but, and, and, and this has very little to do with how many transactions they close. That's not it. It's, it's too soon to do that, to understand that. They're, they might not even be setting consistent appointments at that point, right? Day in and day out, they're not. Are they making their calls? Are they meeting their goals? When you listen to calls, key part of training, Josh, the first 30 days, li- sitting down with them, actually not even listening to their calls, sitting down with them in the room and making calls with them, right? Unbelievably important. Uh, very, I was talking to a mega, mega, mega team leader yesterday, um, you know, hundreds of transactions a year and a relatively small team. So super high performing agents on this team. He still trains people by putting the call on speakerphone in their area. They can't record calls. They call with him in the room on speakerphone. That's how he monitors and trains his, his, his agents. Like there's no other way to do it. Like this, they're in Canada, highly regulated market. So they're like, this is the best way I found, man. Put on speakerphone, go for it. And I'll correct you afterward. Like what you did right, what you did wrong, what you could have done better. We do the exact same thing, except we have the option to record calls in a lot of these states. So we actually have recordings you can listen to. We sit down, we tell them what they did right, we tell them what they did wrong, and we look for improvement the next week. If they're not getting better by the end of the week, wrong person. Yep. Wrong person. Yeah, I love that, man. Yeah, it's super- not, not, not teachable, not coachable. And, and again, when you're letting someone go within five days, it's usually egregious, right? They're just literally not very, you realize, okay, yeah, this person's just not a good fit. They're coming in late. They're not doing the, all the tasks we ask them to do, the baby steps, the easy things. I'm not talking to set appointments by day five. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the basics here, right? So once they make it out of that first week, okay, yeah, okay, let's, let, now let's see what else you can do. And you want to see improvement. You want to see improvement. No one's good at this job the first 30 days. No one is good at this job the first 30 days. You're always teaching them. You're always doing it. You want to have someone that's better on day 30 than they were on day one. That's really what you're evaluating at that point, right? And then when it comes to measuring results of your ISAs, you have to have daily goals, daily goals, not weekly, not monthly. It's too late. You're already late. When you, if you're looking at that, it's, it's daily, right? And yes, and you're going to miss them the first week, week or two. They're not going to meet them. Yeah, that, that makes sense for sure. But, but after that second week, they better be pretty close to meeting those daily goals. And I'm talking about calls made. I'm talking about conversations they should be having on a daily basis, right? If they're not, because again, if they're not making enough calls, Everything else doesn't matter, right? If they're not having enough conversations, then how are you even going to correct for script? They don't talk to anybody, right? So it's, it kind of builds on one thing on top of each other, but it comes back to basics, right? Um, so, so are they even doing that well? And then once they get back to that, then we get, again, third week, fourth week, it gets more interesting. We're talking about objections more. We're talking about how to respond to people. We're making those kind of corrections. So, so that's how people should progress. But a bad hire shouldn't be there more than a week. Right, really shouldn't. And 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 being generous, it shouldn't be there more than a month. You should not have an ISA you fire on month four. You should hopefully have three ISAs you went through to find the fourth that's really good, really good. And you and you and you've refined that process enough. I if if teams did that and knew how to do that, you wouldn't need power ISA. You know, they would would need it. Would need it. It's hard to do. It's, I, I'm saying it, it. It sounds very simple. It's actually very difficult to do to train to learn. That's why we exist, but the process is not an overly complicated process. I think we, we overcomplicate it a little bit. And the biggest mistake, like I said, is, is putting too much effort, time, and energy into interview process. You, you, it, it, there's, there, the, the most important part of this job, you cannot interview for. Yep, yep. I, I, I 100% agree with all that, man. You know, right? Like, I mean, in RI, it, this isn't just about our ISA department, it's about all hires that I'm making, but isn't it? The, I mean, in you know, right? general, right? It's not it's, just, like I said. I, you know, I mean, really the interview process that I have is, is a culture fit, you know, right? Like, do they fit our core value? Is somebody that we want inside our organization? Do I want to be in the, the same office with this person eight hours a day, you know, right? Are they growth minded? Are they, you know, you know, positive, not negative, not addicted, you know, right. Um, you know, all of those things. Um, and then, I'm, you know, we're just huge on, okay. <clears throat> Cause everybody interviews well, everybody's Billy badass, you know, right. Okay. Well, let's uh, create a test, you know, right. So 
you know, I own a software company as well. And let's just say it's a, it's a specific developer that we need for with this specific skill set or this specific code stack. Okay, boom, let's let's design a project that can show us their their skill sets, give them, you know, enough time, but also not so much time where, you know, it puts the pressure on them and then boom, assess how well they did. And then outside of that, if they can prove the skill set um, um, and then they're a culture fit, you know, right? It's, it's boom, it's a, it's a go. And like with our ISAs, it's like, you know, okay, hey, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer this uh, a two-day trial run. I'll pay a hundred bucks each day cash, um, uh, provide lunch each day. The first day, we're going to just be going through and uh, uh, doing an overview and making sure that you know our process, right? Um, you know, our CRM, how this works, know our process. And then there, we don't expect them to master in that time, but it's, you know, how, how resourceful are you? How, how quickly do you pick up this new stuff? How well do you pay attention? I'm looking at how, how detailed are their notes? You know, just those little things. Um, and then the second day, it's okay. Well, hey, now that you have that somewhat down, um, um, you know, here, here's a list of 200 leads. Here's the, here's the script. Go. You know, right? And, and in that, like, I'm not looking for them to, to be flawless. I'm not even looking for them to set appointments, you know, right? But just looking at little, like, okay, how well do they approach us? What's their energy? What's their attitude? You know, right? Again, how well do they follow the instructions that we're giving them, the critiques that we're making? And, and then from there, as you said, when you know what to inspect, what you expect on a daily basis, um, um, you know, it, it flushes it out quickly. And, you know, one other important thing that I, I, I want to just kind of reiterate that you said before is, which comes to um, uh, really kind of number two, which isn't just the, the follow-up process, but also with the ISA role. Um, um, and, and this is just what we've done in-house, but it's, you know, because it's somebody else that's doing the follow-up uh, um, um, that starts the connection. And then there's that pass-off component, you know, right? So you gotta, you know, we've learned that, hey, like you've got to know how to pass that off successfully, how to sell the value of that, the, mm. the teammate agent that you're passing off. You know, right. But then have, okay, well, Hey, what, what at that pass up time in the appointment set, what are the exact steps and, and processes of, of when and what to do that the agent's responsible of what's the ISA doing there. Okay. If that person no shows or whatever, does it go back in the ISA's court, you know, right? Like what are those detours? So then everybody is, is clear on the process, but then they're, they got to communicate as a team, you know, on all of that to be able to do that, that well. And, you know, I, I think that's something that's, overlooked so common is, is people rush the process and so forth. And then I know we're going long on time here, Gus, um, you know, but, but, uh, um, you know, look, dude, uh, most agents that I talk to, not just agent, I mean, mega team leaders, whatever, they, they, they know the pain of creating their own internal ISA department, you know, right? Like it is, it is a, it is a huge right. headache and, and you can get to the point where it's spending 95% of your time babysitting it, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it can be a massive challenge. And I think in a perfect world for all of us, you know, would be a, 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 a company like Power ISA, um, uh, you know, number one, it's probably going to be less expensive outsourcing to a company like Power ISA than trying to do all this in-house, reduces your exposure risk, you know, all this stuff, plus the time that you have involved hiring and find, you know, training and, you know, all of that. Um, uh, uh, but can you just walk us through, you know, what, what it looks like, what kind of services that you guys offer, um, um, you know, what all of that looks like, uh, uh, just for those watching and listening, if, if they have interest, which I, I mean, this is one of the top questions I get on a daily basis is, you know, from listeners of this, plus, you know, coaching clients and so forth is, you know, from people that are asking of, of who's an amazing, you know, outsource or virtual ISA company that they can, they can plug 100%. into. Yeah, awesome. And a great question. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, because I, 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 I can talk about this all day, too. But, you know, uh, one, of, one of the things that sets our company apart is that we're kind of we're a larger company now. Right. So we're able to actually work with realtors that are in different parts of their journey. Right. We're able to work with uh, some of the individual realtors, some of the small teams that aren't generating a ton of leads yet. Right. Maybe they're generating 50 to 100 leads on a, on a monthly basis. We're able to offer them our pay per lead services. Right. Our pay per lead service. You know, starts as a little as like five bucks a lead and it includes either three and, and then just three months of follow up, six months of follow up, 12 months of follow up, kind of whatever you want to want to go from there. But it starts as like five bucks a lead. And most people, that's pretty affordable for most teams. And it's better than not making that second. They're pretty good at making the first call, maybe the first couple of calls. They're usually really, really bad at making that third attempt to that 16th attempt. Pretty not typically not great at that. So that so for five bucks, they kind of got that handled. And, and, and you can have a lot more success uh, uh, than the alternative, right? So we have options, a pay-per-lead service for the smaller teams. 
for the medium sized teams, larger teams, um, you know, higher performing real estate agents, we have a dedicated ISA, right? Which is the, the typical ISA role that you can imagine. It's the virtual ISA that's embedded in your company, either a part time person or a full time person. And that, that's, and that one's a little bit more involved because it is customized uh, to your situation. We try and find the best person available. And we always try to classify these campaigns to be, again, you're, the engineers coming out, right? Because we try to classify them because we understand how we can be the most, how we can be successful um, if we know exactly what we're going to do for you, right? So there's an exploration call. Uh, there's like an onboarding call to get your campaign ready to go. Um, then you kind of meet and greet your ISA. And then we're launching. And those first 30 days of any campaign is about making those adjustments, right? What, learning the, the CRM, the process, the system, the dialer, um, and making the adjustments necessary to meet the campaign goals, right? But it starts, to be really honest with you, is what are the campaign goals? Because if I got someone that comes in, wants to hire a part-time ISA uh, to do circle prospecting, and they want a bunch of appointments within a couple of months, I'm like, You're, we won't sell you that campaign. We just, we'll say, we say no to those cold calling campaigns every day because you're not going to be set up for success, right? We will not take a cold calling campaign that's less than six months commitment because I, I mean, I'll take your money. I'd love to take your money and just run with it for a month or two. You're not going to make, you're not going to make any money, right? And by that, you it's mean like circle prospecting, expired, FISBOs? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly circle prospecting, yeah. Expired, FISBOs, uh, all those outbound prospecting ones. It, those are the toughest campaigns to kick off. And again, they're the, they're the best ROI. Don't get me wrong. Those are the best campaigns, but people have to understand they take any kind of farming, cold farming activity. It just takes longer to get, to get off the ground. Right? So we always set expectations, appropriate expectations. And we, and we said, Hey, we can do this in, cause we've done this a long time, right? This company has been around for five years, you know, back when we only did cold calling to now that we do a really good balance of Facebook lead conversion, Zillow, realtor.com, as well as the cold calling campaigns, we do a lot of things. And we understand what we're really good at, right? Um, and that we get other requests like, hey, can I you know, set up, um, I don't know, a, a campaign for property management, a campaign for renter leads. And we'll be, we, we haven't, either we haven't done those or we don't really do those, right? So we have, we have to have to reject some of these campaigns because uh, the only way to scale a company and be, and be great at it is to like, have a niche, focus, right? Focus yeah. and focus what you can do really, really well. You can kind of hit it out of the park at, right? So, so that, so making sure that you fit into what we can do really well is kind of the first step. And then once you feel that we have a good fit, it's onboarding, ex exploring the campaign, your process and getting your ISA ready to go. And it's all about those first 30 days of any campaign, making those adjustments and making sure we have good communication. And that's why we have, you know, staff, right? You know, I used to do this myself back in the day. I would work, I mean, I would embed, I, I would literally be a campaign manager, like working and making sure that my ISA fit in within the company, right? And fit within the goals and we're making, and we're meeting their daily goals. Now I've got staff that helps me do that uh, to help me scale. The process hasn't really changed. It's setting the right expectation, getting the right button to seat, making sure the first 30 days that we're meeting those goals, the leading indicators are being met and then boom, we're, we're pretty much good to go. Yeah. Awesome stuff, man. I love that you offer, um, you know, I mean, you're very niched. You guys know what you're good at. You know what your specialty is. You know what you can for sure win at with your agent clients, you know, right? So I love that you stay in your lane um, um, and don't try to be all things to all people. I think that's extremely powerful, um, you know, and obviously with your, you, you've proven this and it's really grown out of demand from, you know, you mastering this process o over the years and, and, and so forth. And I love that you offer different options, you know, right? Um, because look, there, there's going to be that individual agent that might, you know, whether it's per lead or, or you know, hey, I only, man, I, I don't need anyone more than 20 hours a week, but then they can scale up time to that 40 hours a week full time and, and keep adding from there. And it gives that kind of progression. And you guys are meeting them where they're at in their business and, and helping them grow, which I love. And so Gus, for, for those that are watching, let's demand if, if they want to learn more about Power ISA, they want to reach out, they want to schedule a, a, a kind of a discovery call to, to, you know, see if you guys are a fit for each other. Where's the best place to go do that at? Uh, and that's our, our, our website, PowerISA.com, altogether, PowerISA.com, and also Facebook, right? If you search, you know, Power ISA on Facebook, you're going to find me, you're going to find my free Facebook group, you can always join that, continue the conversation there, I always love talking about all these topics, lead conversion, online marketing, Facebook marketing, um, for real, all for real estate, really focus on real estate. Um, so yeah, about our website is a great starting point. And from there, we can connect a few different ways. Awesome. And those that are watching and listening uh, right now, as always, regardless of whether you're on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, 
Google Play, you know, Spotify, all the different places that we're at. I know a lot of you are listening to this in the car and, and you know, you might, you might not remember that you are or whatever. If you just scroll below uh, uh, into the notes. So again, any platform that you're watching or listening at, you scroll below, we'll have um, uh, Gus's contact info to, to you know, powerisa.com as well as we'll link right to the Facebook page, all of that stuff um, uh, to make it super easy on you guys. And Gus, man, Truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, man. This is New Year's Eve when we're sitting here recording and, and uh, 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 <laughs> hustling, hustling, man. Going up in the hustle, man, and, and you know, sharing your brilliance with us. This has been amazing, my friend. All right. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I love the show, man. Keep doing it. Yeah, you got it, my friend. And uh, those watching, listen, as always, we truly appreciate you guys being here. Truly appreciate all your support. Keep up the amazing work. Keep kicking ass, and we will see you next time. Peace. I hope you enjoyed this GSD Mode podcast episode. Now make sure you get shit done and smash that subscribe button now.